So I came here, hopefully, with the idea of sharing with you the last six months of experience of working for Synadia. Before I get into that, um, I'm a very interactive person. I've been doing this a long time. I hate it when everybody stares at me blankly. So uh, hands up if you know what NATS is. This is cool, this is nice. Uh, hands up if you think it's network address translation. Yeah, this happens, okay. Yeah, it's interesting, I've got a few fun stories. So I'm gonna go through, you ready for this? 28 slides in 20, I'm not really. I'm gonna probably leave some of this stuff out. I've got some demos, let's see if it works. Um, okay. I'm not just going to sell NATS to you. NATS is an open source project. For those who don't know, we've got tens of millions of downloads. NATS, chances are, it's <laughs> in every software platform that you've touched on the high street today without knowing it. And then we say, hey, I work for Sinead, and they go, who the hell is that? Well, our CEO, Derek Collison, created NATS back in 2011. He rewrote it in Go in 2013. It's been around for as long as Kafka's been around, which might be a bit of a surprise. Um, so therefore, we're the primary maintainers of NATS. Uh, we kind of understand all the logic that keeps the server running. Um, there is a massive amount of NATS content out there. You look on LinkedIn, you look on Twitter, you look on, I think, even Instagram, I saw something, and everybody's got an opinion on NATS. And unfortunately, it's a really, really terrible joke. There's uh, some NATS, so much good content out there as well. But what can I say? The project's been around a long time, and invariably, you get a lot of, uh, I guess, misunderstandings. People get very enthusiastic about NATS, and then they just want to go and talk about it. Now, the biggest problem is the Synadia, we're driving this commercially as an enterprise offering. So what I find is on the open source side, everybody's enthusiastic. Most people can, can grasp NATS very, very quickly, even with all the latest Jetstream stuff, which I'll get into. But the biggest issue we have is you know, reading the, um, the field manual. I'm not going to say the word. So we get a lot of support tickets going, NATS is broke. And we go, oh, not again. And what's wrong? Oh, I can't authenticate. Well, did he create a token? No. So we go from open source to, to enterprise. And actually, there's so much content out there. And we're, we're rebuilding the docs as well. Most of the answers, if you get stuck, they're out there. They're either in the docs, they're either on NATS by example, or they're on the Synadia website. And we're building some, some new content as well to try and help with this and modernize what's already out there. And disappointingly, there's a lot of uh, recently published books which also paint NATS in a very bad light. Um, so who knows about NATS persistence layer? Do you know NATS can do streaming? So if you know NATS can do streaming, put your hands up. So did you know NATS can do KV, key value store? Hands up. What about object store? And then we see like no hands. This is the, the kind of thing. So we've got a lot of stuff going on. And a lot of people think Nats is only PubSub. So they go, ah, oh, you're a rabbit replacement. You go, well, yes. And then we can do lots of other things as well. So what the hell is it? Well, it's client server. So if you've been in this space for as long as I have, and you can measure me by the length of my gray hair, which it is what it is. Um, client server has been around a long time. And what Nats really is, it's client server at massive scale. So. We've literally got NATS on satellites. We've got it on cruise ships. We go down to the browser. So we can go from data center to phone to satellite. And the idea is really that we're creating a data fabric. So client server architectures, I think everybody in the room should be familiar with this. Um, just FYI, not going to be a huge amount of go in this talk. I think we're all gophers. I really want to try and get the value of NATS across um, and also share, like I say, some things that I've tripped over in the last six months. So I've been in networking and network software. So think ISP level data center networking for a long, long time. Um, but it's communications. And NATS is really, really interesting for me because it's just another communication system. So when you think about networking, you think about layer two, layer three, so ethernet and IP and all this other stuff. And then it's down to those pesky developers to go off and build some stuff to handle all the session data, do encapsulation, de encapsulation and all that stuff. And what NATS does, and this is the, the thing I find magical about it, we elevate above the socket layer, we make all that nonsense go away, and we provide a means for you to have any conversation over any kind of uh, subject to, to anywhere. So I know these diagrams are a little bit small, I can send the, send the deck out. It's not really about reading, I mean, we've got lots and lots of good information, I'm not here to sell you the basics. I just wanna share some stories. So we can do PubSub, yeah, we can do request reply, which is actually a unicast PubSub with a, with a reply subject. We can do streaming, uh, KV, and obviously we've got the object store, which is still kind of in a bit of a beta right now, but, uh, but we're getting there. Um, we've got massively huge numbers for NATS. So I've got right now, I think this is an M1 Pro, and with some of the benchmarking tests that we do, I can saturate and run at like 48 gigabits per second on one machine. So when we get a bank ring up and they go, ah, we, uh, we deal with 
a million messages a day, do you think you can cope? We have to slow the system down. We put delays into the tests and they go, oh, that's looking all right. And it's like, well, actually, let us show what you can, you can really do. But as always with IT, it depends. So what you have to do is understand the fundamentals. And with NATS, you have conversations over basically the named pipes over subjects. So the clients connect to NATS and treat the NATS server as a broker. And then without configuring the server to do this, the, sub, the, the client will open a communication channel called a subject. It could be named foo. It could be foo.test. It could be uk.foo.test. And, and that's important for other reasons. But you don't have to worry about silly things like punching through firewalls. DNS knowledge is minimized, and that's also relies on gossip. So you can connect to one server. If that server goes offline, it can reconnect somewhere else, providing there's been a connection there uh, previously. Uh, and some scale numbers, we've been trying to think about this as, as a team and some good recommended some numbers here. Um, with enough entropy, so if you've got an internet-connected system, so you're thinking about sockets and, and how an end client connects to NATS, we can probably do millions of connections, probably not recommended. 200,000 connections per server is kind of where we're going with this kind of thing. Um, but uh, as always, it depends. Um, it depends on your use cases as well. So I'm just going to do a bit, another bit of a, a knowledge tester here. I want to make sure where we are. So do you think NATS can be used in front ends? So web front ends, JavaScript, React, things like that. Hands up if you think it can. Yeah, so we've got a WebSocket front end, and we've got JavaScript libraries. And in fact, and this is where my nerves get the better of me, for SUSECon, we made a game. Web page blocked. It's brilliant, isn't it? I knew this was going to happen. <laughs> Jesus. So if you want to get your phones out, you can go to cybervet.io. Um, we made a game for, 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 I keep saying this, for SUSECOM, because what we wanted to do was show the power of NATS on the front end. Nobody believed that we could, we could use NATS with front end. So the idea is with CyberVet, you have a patient, you have a surgeon. As a patient, you've got to try and kill yourself. And as a surgeon, you've got to try and save the patient. Everything's done through NATS. There's no database. Everything's messaged uh, through the NATS itself. So we do request reply, pub sub. And actually what happens is the browser watches the key values. And any updates that happen in the key value, it updates the browser screen. And um, there was a funny moment, actually, in one of the talks over there. And I think Adelina saw this when we was at KubeCon as well, where at the end of the survey, I sent everybody off to Nats by example.com. They were like, oh, how did, you, how did you do this? It was JavaScript, but it, it wasn't exactly magic. Um, but the fact that we can make a game purely on Nats, so the inbound load balancing and the matchmaking was all on Nats. The in-game um, the in -game games, the three mini games, all coordinated by Nats. You can't manipulate the front end. Everything was done by the, by the back end server. If you want to see that, cybervet.io, and we can go through that. But OK, so Nats can be used for front ends. So NATS can use it in backend components. If every hand doesn't go up at this point, uh, I don't know what's wrong with you. So can NATS be used for backend components? Yeah, all right. And there's everybody else who's asleep, apparently. Yes, it can. Um, so microservices. Can NATS be used in microservices? At this point, if you think about what a backend is, what a component is, we're talking about intercomponent communication or RPC, remote procedure calls between components. So naturally, you extend the logic. Can it be used in microservices? Absolutely. We've got a services API built into NATS, and we've also got some GPB plugins as well to help you generate RPC. So, um, or RPCs. We're truly polyglot in terms of we've got uh, 11 client libraries from uh, naturally Go, which is, I think, it's kind of the best one. Uh, JavaScript, Java, Ruby, Python. And then we've got something like 30 other community libraries of, of varying coverage. Um, so when we talk about clients, what we mean is your code with our client libraries or the NAT CLI tool, and I'll go into that in a moment. Um, but NATS, yes, we can use it in microservices. Now, this one kind of gets interesting. How many of you uh, have got microservices in production with a service mesh? Wow, I thought there was going to be more. OK, this is interesting. So the question then goes, all right, so do you all know what service meshes are to start with? So, OK, you're really going to put me on the spot here, aren't you? So let's say at a high level, we might have a bunch of ingress systems that might handle HTTP, gRPC. We might have uh, approaches like scatter and gather. Something might come in. It might ship a load of uh, requests off either to services running on Linux, something running on Kubernetes, containers uh, and standalone machines, whatever. But the idea is that we also put overlay networks to connect all those things together so we can have the components communicate east to west and then respond in an organized manner through the, uh, through the landing zones or through the ingress controllers. Um, service meshes are interesting, but if you take an engineering view to this and you go, you know what? We own most of the code. Let's put the NATS clients in all of our logic. 
We can do away almost entirely with service mesh. We might need something like a traffic controller, a HTTP endpoint, or something, whatever, you know, whatever protocol that you're using at the edge. But we can replace service meshes. We can replace overlay networks. Now, I used to work for Juniper Networks, and my job was to sell you an overlay network. And I kind of went, hang on a minute, Dave. Something doesn't smell right about this anymore. I don't like this. So I went to work for Synadia because I think actually we're moving on. You know, if, if you've ever used AWS or you've ever used OpenStack, network overlays are a real thing. They're resource intensive. You know, chances are that you've got a TCP offload card or a DPU on a server somewhere to handle all those overlay networks. We can simplify it. So ultimately, your connectivity goes back to host based networking, really and significantly reducing the complexities of your network. So, uh, how many people use Kafka here? Okay, that's fair. So, can NATS replace Kafka? Any guesses? No. Who said that? <laughs> <laughs> There's a door right for there. I'm only joking. Well, I'm going to give that a green tick. <laughs> yeah, damn it. We've got um, actually a, a, what do you call it, return on investment, an ROI paper or total cost of ownership paper on Kafka, if you're interested for anybody who's looking at that. So we can actually uh, replace Kafka in a lot of different scenarios. Um, it's interesting because we drive a lot of web traffic through Kafka versus NAT style conversations. Um, but yes, we can, we can do that. So hopefully at this point, we're kind of building a bit of a story. Does NATS replace network address translation? So if we think about now, NATS is a client server system. Clients connect to the broker. Mm. We don't need to do weird firewall punctries. We can have many layers of network address translation, like in a mobile network, uh, or with you know a cheap and dare I say it, cheap and nasty ISP. Sorry for anybody working in an ISP, that was cruel. But providing the client can go through those layers and the network can maintain state, we can have bi-directional conversations and unsolicited at that. Once a client connects back, we can have something in a data center do a request reply to a to a smart light, to a door control system, to something like that. So does it replace network address translation? No. I'm afraid that's a network function. It's all right. I'm just checking to make sure you're awake, but I like your enthusiasm. That was cool. <laughs> so um, I'm waiting for time. Data Fabric. The NAT story really comes into its own when we start thinking about moving data to where the compute is or the functions that need to act upon the data. And I think this particular diagram, sorry for everybody who can't see this, what we've got here is imagine you've got three or four data center locations. You're going to be in public cloud, AWS, Azure, you've got your own. Um, dare I say Google, who uses that? I'm only joking. We might have some systems with Kubernetes, some with K3S. We might have factory floor in, uh, kind of systems going on as well. And we've actually got this in real life, you know, where NATS is in industry. We've got NATS connected to PLC systems that actually manipulate factory floor machinery, pull the data back, and then present it to something like an operations wall board or something like that to see if, you know, the Dare I say it, the little old ladies working, the machines are working fast enough. Um, but what we can do is we can go from data center down to the machine using one system. Uh, and in the US, for instance, power distribution, we've got lots of subways that use NATS on embedded machinery, which control the machines. It might, a, a system might make a local decision and say, ah, you know, a tree's fell on a power line and created a surge. The, sub, the substation will make an autonomous decision. Maybe it'll try and burn the tree off and you know, give it some more current, but it will report back uh, using NATS over things like 4G because we can do that and NATS can be reliable. Where I'm going with this is NATS, because it's client server and we've got these really powerful clustering systems and I've, I've got loads more information on this. We can have a cluster which spans multiple data centers. We can embed NATS as itself because NATS is embeddable. It's written in Go. It's like 16 megabytes uh, when it's compiled, but you can embed NATS into your programs. And then you can have your programs communicate with the local NATS. And that's all you need to do. You know, and those NATS systems can talk to each other and form this kind of grid and mesh of connectivity. But in the real world, we can span multi data centers. And I think you probably know where I'm going with this. It's multi cloud. We can go between clouds without anything special. We don't need any weird gateways. It's internet connectivity, maybe a bit of cheap uh, connectivity. But from factory floor to satellite to data centers using one system is really, really powerful. And then you start thinking, well, that sounds great, but what about security, right? We can't just treat security as an afterthought anymore. Not that you should have been doing that in the first place, I add very hastily. Um, so we can do authentication. NATS can run with nothing. And I'm going to try and do this again, ready? I can't type at conferences so what I, or, or talks. So what I have to do is like pre-populate everything. I've just started a NAT server. And if I can blow this up a little bit. All I've done is typed in NAT server. We've got a NAT system running. And what I can do, again, sorry, this is where everything falls apart. I can do something like NATS, oops, 
Nats, pub. I'm gonna try and keep this really, really simple because I just can't type. Nats, sub, test. So what I'm gonna do, I've got one Nats subscriber on the right-hand side, subscribing to the subject, test. And I've got one on the left, and all I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna publish. No config, literally the CLI client, which I'll go into in a moment, and the NAT server. It's as simple as that. So out of the box, you can get going very, very, very quickly um, for your, say, uh, I think we call it grasping. You know, you wanna do something, you wanna take NATs for drive, zero configuration. You can literally stand the thing up and run with it straight away. And actually we do a lot of our POCs like this. We use a NATs client to drive the proof of concepts without so much as even writing any code. We've done entire proof of concepts for banks, for ships, for satellite style organizations without writing anything. Um, but that's great. How many of you have either written a blog post or read a blog post that is a sign? I'm going to go through an amazing technology and aren't I great? P.S. Don't put this in production. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a nightmare. Uh, I've been guilty of that in the past. But with Nats, it's relatively straightforward to go from kick the tires to production. So you can run with users and password to basic authentication. You can provide it tokens. You can provide JWTs or JOTs. Uh, and also with 2.10, you can have auth callouts, so your own authentication system can be baked in. So we can do things like we can swap tokens. So you might log into the system using you know, whatever system that you've got, we can do a swap, so your system can gain access to NATs. So that's pretty powerful. So authentication built in, very, very easy to drive, and authorization as well. Maybe you don't want you know, the, the team next door to access one of your streams or one of your subjects. We can lock that down. We can do imports and exports. We can lock everything down, even from the, the machines themselves. But all this is based in, um, it's based in policy. The server configuration itself is quite simple. You know, once you set up things like SSL and you know, your certificate authorities and things like this, NATS is fairly autonomous. You know, you can start conversations on whatever subject you like. Uh, and we have all of these different ways of providing multi-tenancy as well. So out of the box, you can do multi-tenancy. So you could have environment A and environment B. You can use the same subjects and you can have foo in each one. The ships in the night, they never see each other. So we can do all these kind of things. And then naturally, you can do imports and exports. So you can export foo from account A into account B and, and vice versa. It, it's really hard to describe the power of this thing. Uh, and I've been in situations where some of our customers have rang up and gone, we've kind of lost control of our system. And you go, what do you mean you've lost control? And they go, well, we've got you know, 27 data center locations. And you're like, okay. And we've got uh, 150 accounts. So an account is applicable to an application, okay. And then there's like you know, 400 connections per account, which is a user system. And we've got separate authentication and authorization and all these things. It's like, oh my God. And it works. It's absolutely fantastic to see this stuff. So you can go from very, very simple experiments to banking systems, dare I say. Um, anybody uh, use Stan with NATS? So previous to something called Jetstream, and I'm about to hear Jetstream next. Any of you Stan? So Stan was like our original take at streaming with NATS. Yeah, okay. So uh, I'm probably just gonna be very, very honest at this point and say the transition from NATS to Jetstream, sorry, Stan even, get that always the wrong way around. Hasn't been great. I think it's one of the, it's a privilege to be able to come here and talk about this stuff and also share that the team um, is working very, very hard right now on resolving all the kind of issues that get raised when you transition and you know have some technology that's mature as Nats is, where we try and add new uh, new features as well. But we're in a position now where Jetstream uh, is really, really powerful. And Jetstream adds the persistence to Nats. So again, the streaming, the KV object storage uh, is by the, the, by the Jetstream subsystem. And I'm, I'm gonna get to that. I'm just on, on a race against time. So um, some more interesting points. Um, NATs will max out the network and disk IO faster than it will a CPU. So on a 10 gig system, um, you've been warned, you can drown that system very, very easily. So we have instances where tickets have been raised, we've had a P1 from a well-known uh, credit card uh, provider and they've gone, ah, it's broken. And it's not been broken. What they've done, they've got NATS listening on a management interface and on the 10 gig interface. And what's happened is the system's got really, really confused. So you need to think about your, your traffic loads and how things replicate um, across, uh, across the network. So 10 gigabits per second used to be a lot of bandwidth, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Mm, not so much now. NATS will absolutely, you know, to use a, a, a northern term, it will cane that amount of bandwidth. Um, so the network architecture plays a huge role when you're designing high performance systems using NATS. And that means, unfortunately, talking to the infrastructure team. If you work for a company that's cloud first, then you know, maybe you need to consider paying, uh, 
paying for the bandwidth if you've got data center locations, you need to be friendly with your operations team. Um, but we also do some really, really cool stuff as well. So load balancers, and that can do load balancing. So we can do some interesting things with that. You could have some client code, uh, a simple responder. You could have that running in three or four data center locations, depending on where the request comes in, in uh, something called a queue group, um, providing, you, say, let's say you've got three components. They're all attached to a queue group and a subject. The nearest one responds. So you don't need to do load balancing. That's can do all that stuff for you. Um, Jetstream, again, is, is something that's interesting. So there's no such thing as a Jetstream. I've been in design, uh, design meetings where somebody said, oh, there's a Jetstream over there, and there's a NATS over there. That's not really the case. You have the NAS server, and Jetstream is built in. Um, and then we've got these uh, different topologies that um, I'm going I'm to cover in a sec. Who's heard of Raft and Paxos or Paxos? So you know the, the consensus algorithm. So NATS uses Raft. Uh, and you have to consider Raft and the, the traffic it generates. It's very chatty, and you can't get consensus for free. You know, we don't try and change the laws of CAP. Um, something has to give. And unfortunately, to gain raft and gain consensus, the bandwidth is the, the victim that gets knifed in that particular incident. So NATS functionality, if we have the NATS server as a, as a kind of broker, we have clients connecting to the server, then what we have with Jetstream is a client system that subscribes to subjects, and it builds intrinsically ordered streams. And that can be in memory, or it can be on disk. So exactly like you would with, with Kafka, we use subjects, not petitions. You don't have to configure those petitions either before. You can literally just write code, start using them immediately. So server config is very, very, very low. And the thing is, you don't subscribe to a stream you consume from a stream. So some of the things that we see regularly is somebody will be publishing to a stream, the stream's growing, and then they go, ah, oh, I'm going to subscribe to the stream. And they go, that's weird. It's, um, it's not fetching data. You go, well, you subscribed. Yeah, we're testing Jetstream. You're not. You consume from a stream. So the thing is, if you did a pub sub in this system, even though Jetstream might be gathering the data from a subject and putting it into the stream, you're not actually using Jetstream at that point. All you're doing is you're building a buffer to go and read from at a later time. So the weird thing is you can have pub sub going on simultaneously with populating a stream and consuming from a stream. So you get this nature of temporal decoupling. So we can do all sorts of things like you'd expect with Kafka. But we've got two different styles of consumers. So a consumer can consume from a stream in, in, the, in the real time space. So what I mean by that is if you publish 10 messages one per second into a stream, you can actually consume at the same speed that you put them in, which is kind of interesting. And I actually built a karaoke machine a few months ago to show this. It was really bad, and it was Rick Astley. So just forgive me on that one, but I thought it was quite funny. Um, and then <laughs> you can do it instantaneous as well. So you could say, give me all the messages that you've got, and then the system can acknowledge them. We can do explicit acknowledgments. But we've got these things called ephemeral consumers and durable consumers. And ephemeral consumer can be spawned, and you can say, give me everything new, or give me everything from the start, or give me everything from two hours. Uh, that won't survive a reboot. Durable consumers typically will. And what that means for your client applications is you don't have to remember the last message that you got. You can kind of connect and, and carry on where you left off. So these things are really, really useful. But because it's client server, you can do some really crazy stuff. So we can have you know clusters of nine nodes in every city on the planet and provide the network connectivity there. And we can actually have client in the UK, client in, I don't know, Moldova and the things talk transparently. Uh, and then the servers themselves, uh, we've got lots of interesting things. So we have Jetstream domains. So we can actually give a namespace to storage, either memory or on disk. Or we've got placement tags, so great for data sovereignty. So imagine that you've got you know, UK, US style operations where your microservices or your systems or your modular monolith, whatever you want to call it, um, talks across the entire system. But actually, from a regulatory point of view, you don't want that to happen. So we can lock that down from an authorization point of view, even though it's all on the same system. And we can also tag the servers. So when you create a stream, you can actually plant it in the UK, the US, or, or whatever. So there's all this stuff built in. Uh, we've also got a FIPS version for anybody that's worried about that. And we can also do encryption for data on the fly or in transport, um, and also data at rest as well. So from an operational point of view, we've got a lot of, a lot of stuff there. Um, long lived jobs, interesting one. Anybody use FAS here? What about Lambdas, functions as a service? I know it's hot, by the way. I can see lots of eyes closing, so thanks for bearing with us on this. Um, NATS is great for long lived jobs. So, what we can do, we can have things like a, a worker queue or a work stream. So, the idea is we might have requests coming in from a web front end, and you might have, I don't know, 10 systems load, uh, processing the load uh, from that particular stream. And there's two or three things that, that you can think about here. One is how you reliably execute those files. What if it dies? What if something bad happens? So you can do negative acknowledgments. 
um, in which case Nats tries to re-deliver. So the idea is that you can retain the message, you can try re-delivering. When the job's done, it acknowledges, or you can do it in progress every 30 seconds to tell the NAT server, don't re-deliver, I'm okay, I'm alive, I'm working. Um, and we've got lots of different ways of handling that. Now, I'm gonna blast through here, looking at time again. Um, topologies are really, really useful. Clusters, we can have an odd number of nodes if you require persistence, so we can do even numbers, uh, or maybe even one if you don't care, if you're doing ephemeral stuff, just like PubSub. Um, clusters require full mesh connectivity, and that's something to think about. That means normalized infrastructure. Three servers, roughly the same CPU, roughly the same RAM, you're gonna need the same style network to, to keep performance normalized across those systems. Um, super cluster, so you can have clusters of clusters. Each cluster has a full mesh requirement, and as you connect those clusters together, we have these things called gateways, which minimizes the number of connections that you have to configure between nodes. But this is a one hop system. NAT's in a cluster, NAT's in a super cluster, messages traverse one hop away, which basically means your network, again, your network topology plays a major part here, how you design these systems. And this is great for kind of planet scale style um, you know, operations and survivability. We've got these things called leaf nodes, which bind accounts. So we can actually have two separate NAT systems, entirely separate NAT systems, and we can place a small NAT node, same NAT server in between, to bridge those domains. So we could have, say, uh, we might have some analytic function running in the US, and we've got UK operations. We can place a NAT leaf node in the middle to provide that access. It's like a firewall, but at the application level, at the messaging level, uh, to, to bridge those domains together. And then we've got things like hub and spoke. So to break the one hop rule, you can have a spoke, or a cluster of spokes in the UK, a cluster of spokes in the US, and actually maybe you're an Irish firm. So you've got a hub in Ireland, everything has to go through Ireland, you're doing regulatory stuff, you're recording systems, you're analyzing traffic as it flows through, in which case a hub and spoke system, the spokes follow the network. There's no weird implicit one hop system, there's no weird networking things uh, going on underneath, which is kind of interesting. We've got some customers doing this, so they've actually got a stateless hub there's no persistence, there's no storage, and all of the spoke nodes contain all the data, the streams, the KBs, all that kind of thing, and they're accessing everything through the, uh, through the hub, and you can do dual hubs and all this kind of thing. Uh, so NATS is incredibly flexible, but it's not without danger. Um, this is a real life uh, incident. Um, it's quite easy to box yourself into a corner. So what we have is we have a server cluster at the top, and we've got a leaf node at the bottom, and we've got two accounts, or technically four accounts. We're doing an export from account A into account B at the top, and we're doing the same export from account A and importing it into account B at the bottom. And what's happening is we've got a duplicate message on the top right-hand side, and that's because of this one-hop system. As you export from account A and import into account B on a leaf node, it still propagates it because it's not left the system. So on the top right-hand corner, you see duplicate message. And the way to get around that is to have uh, a naming system for your subjects. And this is one of the things that I tripped up on quite early on in my, my time at Senadia. So what you might have is local underscore foo, and that prevents a problem from happening. You've now got a local import for a subject uh, instead of using the same one, and that gets around that particular issue. This doesn't come up much, but it's quite fun when it does, and we're working on some additional controls to prevent that from happening as well. <sighs> I'm against the clock on this purely because I wanted to go through some demos. Um, any questions so far? And what I want to do is just go through some go through some basics. That's I'm, I'm probably well over at this point, am I? I am so sorry. Okay, <laughs> thank you for this. Docs.nats.io, examples.nats.io. If you want to join us on Slack, it's great. You know, come and chat to us. Slack.nats.io. Um, and if you're interested, check out Synadia. We've got a SaaS and a little of things. Thank you very much for having me. I'm off. <laughs>